and welcome back to the second segment of our show this morning. Uh, we're shifting gears and going into a conversation with uh, Deshane Gutierrez. She is a clinical psychologist. Good morning. Hi, good morning. Good morning. And we're going to be discussing this morning men, depression, and mental health issues. Good morning once again. It's a broad conversation to have, one that perhaps we haven't really had um, or hasn't really come to the fore, not until recently. The developments of last week, for instance, kind of brought this thing um, to the forefront of public discourse. Um, I know the idea of men speaking about depression <laughs> and men being able to share how they feel about certain things <laughs> seems somewhat taboo in our society. <laughs> I'll just put that out there <laughs> and have you uh, begin to narrow down some of these points. Well, I'm glad that I'm speaking to two young men mm -hmm. because indeed it is a very important topic and one that we don't often talk about. Um, while there were a lot of incidents that happened last week, um, this discussion about men and mental health was something that I was speaking to Miss Annie Palasso who held a um, seminar over the weekend yes. about men and mental health and different issues relating to men. This is also a conversation that is not only happening in Belize but also regionally. Trinidad last week also was having panel discussions about men and mental health wow. because it seems to be something that the Caribbean is experiencing whereby our men aren't speaking enough about mental health issues. Now mental health issues are is, is still a taboo but for men, it's even more taboo because while women are always seen as more expressive, when you, th when you hear men, what, what words come to play? Domination, mm -hmm. you know, strong, strong, you know. So when we hear about mental health issues, expressing feelings, there is this fear that I will be up here weak, mm -hmm. that, you know, I, my power will somehow reduce if I express these feelings I'm experiencing. So that is why men and mental health issues is very important that we talk about it. Would I be going out on a limb by suggesting, and I'll ask it in the form of a question so it doesn't seem as if <laughs> though I'm putting my own opinion out there. If you look at the composition of the family, the household, right? If you have a situation where both parents are there so that you have somewhat of a balance in terms of being able to learn and express certain things versus a situation where, for instance, you're growing up in a single parent environment where you have your mother. And perhaps growing up, your mother would say, suck it up, you know, man not supposed to cry, A, B, C. Whereas perhaps having a father around would allow for a different channel or a means of, you know, expressing certain feelings, fears, etc. Do you think that perhaps that has a prevailing effect on the way men in our Belizean society either express themselves or repress certain feelings. Those are factors indeed, mm -hmm. but mental health isn't just about the social aspect, mm -hmm. about how you're um, brought up. Mm -hmm. There's also a biological component. So you could, have, you could raise in a two-parent home and there's pro um, guidance and support, but that does not mean that you won't have any mental health issues. It, it, those are supportive factors and buffers, yes. But it doesn't make it for people who come from mm -hmm. um, two household, two parents' household have the financial support that they won't have mental illness. Mental illness doesn't discriminate against age, sex, family background, economic background. So we are all, we all have the possibility. And so it's, it has two components, the biological component and the social component. And those play a factor in it as well. So it's not just, oh, well, single parent, um, children who grew up in um, single parent household are more likely. Because again, how they were raised also plays a factor. Is it a biological component? Is it something that three generations ago, someone experienced depression or someone have a bipolar disorder or schizophrenia. So that genetic component also plays a role. So yes, indeed, in terms of the culture, mm -hmm. you know, how we raise our men plays a factor. There's also the biological aspect as well. No, I, I don't have the numbers, um, but I would assume that there's a, such a thing as a, a function, somebody who has mental health but is functional, um, and they're able to um, manage their depression or their mental illness in such a way that they're still productive that we it's hard to see yes there are some depending on what type of mental illness that 
one, they, they have learned over the years how to manage it. And there are some who probably because they're getting support from other form, whether it's from a counselor, from a pastor, whatever support that they have, that it does, it's not something that we blatantly see. And that's why sometimes it's hard for people to say, well, nothing wrong with him. Mm -hmm. He's okay. Mm -hmm. He doesn't to be stubborn or he's just doing this because mental health is not something that as you look at someone, you can often say, okay, this person is suffering from it. But doesn't that create and you'll forgive my, my expression here, I'm very dim on being able to put this clearly. Doesn't that create the effect of what we would call a ticking time bomb? Mm -hmm. Where you're not, you're not seeing, you're not experiencing yeah. what that individual is going through mentally. And so we take for granted that everything is okay until something triggers mm -hmm. a reaction. And then we realize, you know what? That person may have been dealing with certain issues all along that went by unnoticed. Yes. Yeah. And that's why it's important that we are sensitive to other people. Because um, we never know what each person is experiencing. And so because, of that, because we can't say for sure what anyone is experiencing, being mindful of the language that we use when we're talking and describing other people, because we don't know what they're experiencing. And that is why it's very important that we start the conversation about men and mental health issues, how men can identify. Because one of the things that men is they sometimes don't know that they're experiencing depression, for example, because they don't know the signs for themselves. You can't pay no man, you have to pay bills. Well, I have time for <laughs> worries. <laughs> well, paying bills and worrying about bills is also something to be concerned about because eventually it affects your social functioning, it affects your personal life, it affects your economic. So if you're in a state whereby it's hard for you to go to work and be productive at work, then you'll get reports from your supervisor, you have issues with your colleagues, and then that transfers to going home. When you go home now, you're already irritated, you're agitated, that affects your relationship with your partner, your children, and then sooner or later, you don't want to go to work. Mm -hmm. You don't want to go to work eventually, you know, and that affects, okay, well, income coming in. So it, mm -hmm. it all plays a role. So sometimes when we suppress certain things, it still affects in other areas, and that's when it becomes even more difficult because Depression doesn't affect only one area. And it's not just, okay, well, I feel depressed, okay. You know? So minimizing it is one of the challenges that we have. When we minimize the impact of what we're experiencing, it seeps through mm -hmm. and it builds up. Just like what you were saying, it builds up over time. And then so when there's an outburst, that's when we realize, hey, this person is dealing with something more than what we thought. Six, one of the biggest issues for men Apart from, well, I would say that the reason why they have economic problems is because they're really chasing a, a, a derivative of the sex drive, which is you're trying to provide for a family, you're trying to provide some, some people um, for the woman in your family um, as well. But I wanted to expand it a little to support systems, going back to what you're talking about. I, I, I know from my personal experience somebody who I thought was mentally ill, completely mentally ill. And that person met someone, fell in love, and this is somebody who I thought was completely gone. This is, this is no gray area. And after having a child, the person just became normal, um, was functional, took on a job. If you saw the person, you probably wouldn't even know that the person was completely gone. And we have seen the reverse in terms of the reports from the news is that the recent uh, gentleman with the bulldoze, the bulldoze of um, addiction that, that he, one of his support cores was taken away. How do you, as somebody who's looking on, how can you identify, you're a clinical um, psychologist, how can you identify these supports so that you don't take them away and so that you can add to get somebody to where they are able to function? Taking away the support system. How can you identify? What, what so you, support systems are generally um, there's a list. So I could talk about a various list, but for each individual, for them, that support system does not mean that everyone on that list will be their support. So your support system is usually people that you could rely on, people that you feel that you could relax with, you know, guidance, persons who could provide you guidance. So for example, um, if you have a good relationship with your parents, you have a pastor that, you're, that you can go to. If you have teachers, a, a teacher, a police officer, someone in your, in your environment that is a role model to you. Those are usually support system. Your friends, depending on, can you talk about certain things without feeling judged by your friends? 
So we, have, we all have support systems. It's how much we believe that social system is as impactful in our particular life. So you mentioned in terms of having your mom as a teacher. Yes. You know, so that was a support system for you. You know that I had that person that I could depend very on, lady. and a, a, a very strong lady for you. So, first, those persons, for example, who may not have a strong relationship with their parents, it does not mean that they don't have any other support. So you talk about um, your it was a cousin, hmm? your cousin that you thought had a mental no, a friend, a, a friend. friend. A friend. So probably this person became a support system for him and that helped him to process what he was going through and probably she, pro she provided some stability. Okay, let's plan and let's organize. So having that is someone that you could help strategize how to go through things. And when we have a support system, it's like a buffer. It helps us to experience the challenges that we're facing because we all face challenging experiences. And so sometimes not feeling alone, not feeling secluded, helps us to process the information, help us ride the tide, so to speak. Can I, can I, can I <clears throat> ask this? Your individual personality, some of us are extroverts, some of us are introverts. And as such, notwithstanding issues that we're facing, we still find comfort in being able to share what we're going through with our friends and, and our circle, as we'd say. If you are extroverted, you would find that, hey, but I have a rough day, mm -hmm. marital issues, etc. I'm able to share that openly with my guys. Whereas someone who is introverted tends to keep things yeah. close to the chest, right? And so that they don't really express anything that they're going through with anybody around them for whatever reason. Do you believe that that in itself plays a huge role, especially when it comes to men, given all the other factors that we've outlined? Those, those probably may play a role, but mm -hmm. it's not a matter of, oh, introverts experiences this more than extroverts, mm -hmm. because introverts may have other outlets that they experience. So while they may not come and say directly to everyone that, hey, I'm experiencing marital mm -hmm. issues, they probably have other outlets. And it's the same way that men who um, express that, yeah, I'm having marital issues, they may just say it like that and then that conversation dead. Mm -hmm. So saying it is one thing, but after going through the process of dealing with yes. what you're experiencing. Would they begin with being able to vent though? Like venting helps, but chest? only for a while. Because venting only helps to encourage that behavior at times. So after you vent, all right, the feeling comes back and it's like venting more and it's just, mm -hmm. and it continues and then nothing happens. Working out a problem is problem solving skills. Can you problem solve? Can you know, okay, yes, it's good sometimes to take a minute back or to just say what you're feeling, mm -hmm. but then what? And that is where there's a disconnect. The then what after you say what you're experiencing and identifying those signs mm -hmm. because men tend to minimize what they're experiencing as well. Or if they talk about it, anyways, no worry about that. And we call it compartmentalized. Compartmentalized, you put yes. Certain things in put certain, certain room things and in you lock certain the door. room and then you lock the door. And then you never <laughs> want to open that door. But then it seeps through for yeah. different things. And when men are in their hangout, you know, they're mm. hanging out, it's oftentimes drinking a lot. And so when they socialize and they talk about it, they're like, why well, don't worry about that? You just, you just need our lady, you know? You just <laughs> need. And then so they brush it off. And because we tend to brush it off a lot, I won't talk to you about what's really affecting me. There's a part of it is marital issues, but there could be more. But because you already throw one lady in the picture, you're not, con you're not continuing the conversation. Mm -hmm. But if, if I were to define a man an unromantic, to his unromantic minimum, um, the things that are important to a man, more so to my mind than a woman, and you can please correct me immediately <laughs> when I'm wrong, <laughs> is power, as you said, is important to the modern man. Control is important, and meaning is, con is important to a modern man. But when you look at the way society is right now, the construct of society, there is a move that the fairer sex seems to be in control of, I mean, from a, and, and I know from a, from a female perspective, you might say that that might not be the reality of it, but the perception is that there's a swing going that way. So that where men are is that they feel that their position is a little bit more diluted, some, or at least under attack. Do you think that that contributes, that perception contributes to this, to hard to find meaning 
you don't demand air hose, but you know the work, nobody. Yeah, and so, so there are these things that, which are the reality of the social construct, which feed directly into who we are as a core. Yes, yeah, so that breadwinner role mm -hmm. does play a factor. Um, when we hear about men, we think, like I said, power, right? And we believe that being the powerhouse means that you should have dominion over everything. Mm -hmm. And I think that is a misconception that both men and women Other have. Other people call it being a king. Being a king, okay. Mm -hmm. So that is still also a misconception because now what happens is men, men self-worth is tied to what they could provide. Mm -hmm. And so when they're not the person bringing in the most income or when they're not making all the decisions, it's like, well, I am not worth anything. Mm -hmm. And so that adds to it. And really kind of in modern day, mm -hmm. Would you want your wife to stay at home and you bring all the income? Me? I'll mm -hmm. speak for myself, no. Okay. Whatever she's happy. <laughs> Whatever makes her happy. <laughs> all right. But we're, we're probably not the prototypical examples of... No, but it still adds to it. Because yes, even though she works, but let's yeah. say now she starts to bring in more income than you. Both of you are working. There are times where they're going to be like, hmm. I don't know, man, at this house. So there are different ways you want to say, okay. I wouldn't necessarily feel challenged by income i'm speaking for myself here right income wouldn't necessarily you know back me into a corner and be like okay well the woman all of a sudden now has more influence over decision making in the household no not over finances but when you look at other areas of managing family and managing the household then your role as a man in my opinion is clearly defined in terms of the things that are expected of you, in terms of the things that you are to deliver on. And such is the same for the woman. Like, you know, my woman do this, that, and the other. I do this, that, and the third. And then if we look at finances, if we look on, on any other, then we could try to, you know, find common ground and meet at a halfway point for that. that that's how I look at that, without necessarily relinquishing uh, power either way, or influence of any. So that is a healthy way of dealing with it, mm -hmm. you know, and having that conversation with your partner of, okay, what will we, how can we merge together? That it's not a, she feels that, okay, I'm being, I take over the man role because of certain mm -hmm. things. So it's a two-way street. So having a conversation about men and mental health issues, I believe it's a men and women discussion mm -hmm. because it also plays in terms of how do women see their men mm -hmm. and how do the men get chastised for certain things that they expect of men? Because you know there's a lot of expectations. Mm -hmm. Men have ex you. men have expectation of what they think they should be, mm -hmm. and women have expectation of the men that they have in their life as well. So how do the how do women see the men in their lives? Because that that helps to dictate the conversations that they have and how they relate to each other as well. So those also play a role. You know, uh, when when I walk down Albert Street going into Queen Street. Um, I guess I said again, I don't know the numbers, but the clear examples of persons who have mental health issues, some of them depression, bipolar, there seem to be a disproportionate number of men to females. If you go on Albert Street and just look at the, the vagrants out there, to every four men, you have maybe about one female, if it's that sparse. It, it seems that the one thing that men are running from, which is not looking like they're weak, that eventually we just become so overwhelmed. What specifically? Because <laughs> men, don't like to, men don't go to the health system until it's really something. So because until of- Until it hits the fan. Until it hits the fan, yes. Oh. So that's the reason. So women more tend to, are better able at identifying and willing to seek help a little bit more than men. And so, if, for example, even when men are sick, mm. it doesn't have to work with mental health, anything. Just being sick, ah man, I'll, I'll stay home. <laughs> and you're the yeah, pain. Sleep so it indoor. I just sleep it <laughs> off, or I just need a hot shot a of Vicks. tequila yeah. or a Vicks or something. <laughs> and so going to the doctor, going and seeing anyone isn't their um, go to. And so they wait <coughs> until the very end. And sometimes it's that breaking point mm -hmm. that is when they realize that something is wrong. Absolutely. One in eight men suffer with mental health issues. Wow. Right? Wow. And they're about 75% chance more will complete suicide than females. So it's very important for men to learn to identify the signs of when they're experiencing mental health issues. And for, for example, with depression, 
men display depression different from females. So when we hear depression, we think about sadness because depression is characterized mainly as um, feeling sadness, mm -hmm. low mood, change in appetite, change in eating, change in sleeping, not enjoying the pleasurable things that they used to mm -hmm. for a time frame of two weeks. For men now, we, we won't always see sadness. We'll see anger. We'll see irritability, mm -hmm. you know? And so, and the thing with that is, well, men are typically more angry than female, more aggressive. So it's harder for them to <laughs> identify these signs. So men tend to be more angry and mm -hmm. more irritable than females. And their escape, what they do is, in terms of pleasurable activities, they may not decrease the stuff that they like. They mm -hmm. may amplify it, mm -hmm. you know. They engage more in risky behavior, increasing drinking, multiple sex partner, mm -hmm. escaping, you know, just partying all weekend. They find drugs, whatever it is, to escape. So socializing, when we say, when you ever see a payday, bars are completely filled with a lot of men. It's not saying that all of these men is experiencing depression, but I'm saying it's part of our, one is part of our culture, but it also mm -hmm. signifies that it's harder for men to see it because the it's things normal. that they enjoy doing it's normal. may seem normal. But it's all one here. Everything disappears into this cloud called socializing. Yes. Mm -hmm. And so that is the difference between male and female when they're experiencing depression. We, when we hear depression, oftentimes we think about the loner. Mm -hmm. But it's the same behavior that we would say, well, it's most extroverted, just like the party. Could be signs as well. Mm -hmm. So knowing that, that sense of feeling of hopelessness, of worthlessness. And so it's saying these words, hopelessness and worthlessness, mm -hmm. it's hopeful that men could identify that there are times when they're thinking about this, they're feeling this way. And so when they engage in their behavior, it's self-reflection. Okay, I'm experiencing this right now. And it's more than I just want to hang out with my buddies. It's more than that. It's more than I like to drink. See, see this, this brings me to a fundamental um, challenge for me and I guess for most men, which is that women have a different approach to life. A woman can sit down and just be talking for hours about problems. I want you to listen. A man, after he hears the first sentence, starts to immediately think, how can I fix this? Mm -hmm. And when Earth tunes it out altogether, <laughs> depends on the gravity of the <laughs> It's not his bull, I don't go that far. <laughs> I'm listening to every statement. <laughs> but each, each time you add on a new thing, I am thinking, how do I fix it? Mm -hmm. And when you're doing that internal reflection as a man, and you're thinking, okay, well, this is an issue for me, the economics, or I'm not feeling empowered or I'm not or I'm having these issues, um, or my love relationship isn't uh, the way I want it to be. Each one of those things as a man, you go through an amplified stress level because you're thinking, how do I fix this? And with those things, you can't fix it because the gatekeeper is normally feminine or your partner, whoever it is. Um, and so how do we have a a male approach because a man does not want to see me completely deconstructed mm -hmm. to be built back up. I'm thinking among a work. I don't know if you use that. I'm thinking about among a work I have to do together. I don't have time for that. What kind of approach can men take that we don't become completely vulnerable and completely deconstructed to get to a healthy place mentally uh, and, and to move beyond what we find to be normal? Because your power tell me, go and shoot that. Papa, tighten up. <laughs> yes, so tighten yeah, up. Man. Be a man. Yes. You know? but what is the masculine approach which is healthy to mental health? The masculine approach is apart from doing your physical health stuff, you know, the exercise, the hanging out, the eating right. Those are things that are healthy. But I think one of the best things I can say to men is learning your own um, <coughs> symptoms, knowing your own body, mm -hmm. knowing your process. Because each man still process differently, mm -hmm. and manlyhood is exhibited differently for each one of them. So I think education is the, one of the most important things. What is manly for one man may not be too manly for another man. Mm -hmm. Yes, and I do understand that for some men, sitting down and talking about your feelings is something scary. It's scary because it, uh, it goes back to what we believe man is. Makes you vulnerable. And I'm that always, vulnerability. I'm always been puzzled, right? Like, <laughs> I socialize a lot, I'll be honest with you. Uh, my hangout group is my, my circle, my core of friends, my brotherhood, my fraternity, right? 
But I've always seen that when I interact with certain members of my circle, that each with their own personality has a different take or point of view when it comes to dealing with personal issues of emotion, right? Like, if something bothers me, I Sana Kertano, I'm not afraid to cry if it brings me to that point. Have no idea, no, no problem with it. It doesn't take anything away from my manhood or sense of manhood. Whereas someone else would be like, by I don't mind cry over that. I just, you know, get over it or whatsoever. I'm saying that to say that we look at things differently, right? And our own support groups, the idea of perspective always has a way of shifting things. The way we look at things, the way we approach things, the way we internalize things. Once we are able to express, you have to be open to a different point of view than the one that you're putting out there, right? So that when you look at the family dynamic, you look at the mother and the father, or probably a child that is able to understand at a certain age some of the problems you're facing. You have to be open to the fact that, you know what? My wife may see things a bit differently than the way I see it. My daughter and my son might have a completely different impression altogether. But these are the things that affect me, and I need their input to be able to come to a point where I'm either comfortable with what I'm facing or I understand exactly what I need to do to either change or address the situation at hand. And I'm thinking most of us don't have that. Like, like for whatever reason, we either not talk that, we're not cultured that kind of way, or we shun any kind of um, outlet for us to be able to channel some of these, these thoughts, these feelings, etc. And that is exactly right. I, so I'm just putting that out there. And maybe, I'm, maybe I'm going no, through my it, own therapy. <laughs> yeah. no, it, the bill. It, is, it is true. You know, we're, yeah. we're cultured that way. And that's why mm. I said in the beginning, it's not just a man issue. It's a woman issue as well. Because mm. mothers raise their children, you know, their sons. And what, are the, what is the language that they're saying? Don't mm. worry about it. No cry. Get up. You're a man. You have to protect your sister. You need to protect your brother. So again, from a beginning, from an early age, men internalize that this is my rule, that mm -hmm. somehow their sex determines how much ex emotions that they can share. Mm -hmm. So that also plays a role uh, as well. well one of my, my final questions is in terms of, wh when you look at males, unlike females, the ideal male is an alpha male. And that's, that's not something coming from me, that's something coming from nature. Mm -hmm. Deep down, um, evolutionary wise, every man is looking to be the alpha in something. Mm -hmm. um, and that's why we have gangs, and that's why we have different areas where people, um, mm -hmm. men in particular, hold on to and not let go because I am the alpha in that. It's something that drives the human man. There's also the phenomenon of the ultra alpha. <laughs> I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> the, super, the, the superman phenomenon, the super oh. predator. Yes, yes, yes. <laughs> But my, my question was really a reverse question, mm -hmm. which is one of the things I've learned is that as much as we want to be alpha males, you think that depression is the opposite of that. Mm -hmm. But depression gives you some control. How do we look at depression as actually something natural that everybody goes through it? And to look at the control aspect of it. Can you say, come out of the depression, man. But depression is something I can control. Mm -hmm. And as a man, I want control. So I might stay in something which is negative, but it's actually a way of me being alpha. You can't tell me if you come out of my depression. No. OK. So having depression <laughs> or any mental health issue, you know, men oftentimes think about you know, how can I regain control. Mm -hmm. But controlling how this um, state of mind affects you is a part of the control. How can you be willing to say, I can seek help? And asking for help doesn't mean that takes away your control. It doesn't take away your manhood. Mm -hmm. I think it's very manly that you can say yeah. that you need help. That it's manly that you can identify what is affecting you, your weaknesses, and how you can work towards achieving it. You said that men want problem solved. Yes. For you to problem solve, you yeah, need to identify, identify what is yeah. the problem. Yeah. And then strategize, rather than escaping engaging risky, risky behaviors, those, those aren't problem-solving skills. Mm -hmm. Delay mechanisms. The, those Suppression. are delay mechanisms, right? And so reaching out, speaking out, those are, th that start the process of your problem-solving skills. Seeking mental health professionals, that is a problem-solving skills. Because we oftentimes think, well, going to see a counselor or a psychologist 
is sitting down and just talking, talking, mm -hmm. talking, talking, and nothing happens. And we know that men are uncomfortable with talking. Mm -hmm. But what you also learn is strategies. Aimless talking, we have a problem with. Yes, with an aim, with a purpose, mm -hmm. and learning skills, how to learn how to strategize, what, is su what suits you. So going to a counselor doesn't take away your manlyhood. Mm -hmm. You know, it empowers you. Counseling is about empowerment. And I think we also have that as a misconception. That is why it's difficult for men and women to want to seek professional help at times because we feel uh, I'm giving this person my power. Mm -hmm. That vulnerability. I don't want to be vulnerable. And we have in this profession, it's, there are a lot more females than males. And again, that adds to it. But go for this skill. Go for the problem solving skills because that is essentially what will help you process what you're going through. All right. Quite an interesting discussion this morning, and what a way to end. <laughs> <laughs> a very important discussion, nonetheless. Uh, Deshane, we're grateful to have had you with us this morning and Thank you for having have me. this. Con we need to have a conversation like this more often. Uh, I to believe be able that to we do. Put and certain things out there. November. Um, in some countries, they call it Movember. Mm -hmm. You see, with the whole beard thing, it's uh -huh. also a way of talking about emotions as well. So in mm -hmm. certain countries, November is dedicated to men and mental health issues. I shall nice. grow. <laughs> 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 thanks again for joining us this morning. All right, thanks for having me. We're going to take a commercial break, and then when we come back, it's for the final segment of discussion this morning, which is with members of the Belize Police Department and their law enforcement porch run to discuss people with disabilities. So stay tuned, we'll be back after these messages.